All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jake May. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Pennington Biomedical Research Center, which, if you're unfamiliar, is about uh, an hour or so up the road in Baton Rouge. And I'm here to present to you all on uh, breath prints and how uh, they may be an untapped resource to inform human health and disease. Uh, just a little background on myself and my research program. Uh, I run the Mitochondrial Energetics and Nutrient Utilization Lab at Pennington Biomedical, where I'm largely interested in the impact of nutrition on pulmonary health. Um, I'm also interested in the output of the pulmonary system or your breath and the molecules in the breath and whether or not that can inform us about someone's internal metabolism. Um, one of my primary research arms is looking at whether manipulating uh, the diet we have or nutrient utilization uh, can impact mitochondrial energetics. And if we change, whether the body is utilizing carbohydrates or fats or even ketones for fuel, can that impact human health and disease, or in this case, the pulmonary system? Ultimately, my goal as a, as a registered dietitian, for, first and foremost, is to find new uh, and important ways to share lifestyle information to individuals so they can better uh, manage their disease. Um, so can we give them personalized diet advice to help them with their therapies managing various conditions, including uh, pulmonary diseases? But onto the exciting part, uh, the breath. It actually has a long history in human health and disease, dating back to uh, Hippocrates in the classical era, where uh, he noted that individuals that had poor health also had bad breath. In the 1700s, we identified a couple more molecules, oxygen and carbon dioxide, and we know that's involved in respiration. Today, we use that in our metabolic research. So we use these molecules to understand someone's basal metabolic rate or what nutrients they're burning as fuel. Are they burning carbs or fats? In the 1800s, we had the findings of breath ketones and breath ethanol, which the latter of which we used in sobriety testing today. And then breath research really accelerated in the 1900s when Linus Pauling, uh, one of my favorite vitamin C researchers, uh, identified 250 substances in the breath. And today, the breath has modern clinical uses. We use it in the clinical setting to identify bacterial infections or even airway inflammation in individuals with asthma. And what's great about this is it's a very convenient breath sample. Uh, once you know the molecule you want, um, a participant or patient can blow into a simple device for about 10 seconds, and you get a near instantaneous readout on the quantity of those breath molecules. So it has exciting potential for different diseases or conditions that don't have a biomarker uh, because it provides this really inexpensive, rapid and non-invasive way to do screening. So um, I want you to think of the breath print like a fingerprint. It's very complex and individualized to each person, but imagine a fingerprint that changed and was modified based on your internal health or certain diseases that you had. Um, and I think we're on the forefront of doing this as we have had a lot of technological advances and widespread availability of mass spectrometers that we've now identified over a thousand molecules in the breath. Uh, and these are currently being used in the research world to identify or even characterize different stages of disease and even some cancers. So one of these areas that we've jumped into is in malnutrition. So I'll show you just a quick example of the potential for the breath. Now, malnutrition, especially in the clinical setting, is a major issue. We've been working for decades on finding a, a biomarker in the blood, and they've just been ineffective. And this essentially makes us rely on self-report screening questionnaires. So when someone goes into the hospital setting, uh, they're essentially asked very basic questions, and we use that to predict their malnutrition status. This creates a huge gap between the number of people that have malnutrition and the number of people that we can actually screen successfully. So current estimates suggest 30 to 50% of individuals that go into a hospital have malnutrition. We're only successfully grabbing about 7% of them right now. And that's because we don't have an adequate biomarker that can fit within the really um, fast and tight window of the, in, the inpatient screening setting. Uh, so what if there was something outside of the blood that we could sample, a novel tissue perhaps, uh, where we could find biomarkers? And I'm going to propose to you that the breath really represents that area. Um, we did publish one report. This was in the Journal of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. This is kind of the flagship journal for clinical malnutrition work. 
And here we showed that two molecules, one octene and ammonia, were reduced in the breath of individuals with malnutrition compared to their disease-matched counterparts. Uh, beyond that, what gets really exciting when we talk about measuring thousands of molecules instead of just one or two, especially with the uh, advent of artificial intelligence and new statistical approaches, you can take multiple data points and reduce the dimensionality of that data and create breath clusters. And you can see here how uh, individuals with malnutrition kind of cluster in this area in the black, our disease controls cluster in the red, and our healthy controls cluster in the green. Uh, so it's this really combination of um, breakthroughs in technology and machine learning that help us uh, really dive into the potential uh, for breath research. Um, in our lab and in combination with the infrastructure at Pennington, Pennington Biomedical is really poised um, to accelerate breath research, especially when it comes to metabolic phenotyping. So my interest has been in clinical malnutrition, uh, but there are many other areas where this would be applicable. Um, Drug uh, metabolites show up in the breath, so you could use it as potentially a measure of compliance. Uh, you can get it as a measure of diet. You can understand whether someone's eating enough calories or not. Um, the, uh, the ways you can use the breath, I think, are really endless. And Pennington and our state-of-the-art metabolic research is really poised to answer questions that very few people in the world can answer in combination with the breath. Um, we also have clinical capabilities, not only with our own metabolic and bariatric surgery centers and obesity clinics, but we have local hospital affiliations. And we have this infrastructure that allows large scale expansion of the breath research. Um, and also in terms of uh, the database, if you're unfamiliar with Pennington, I mean, we have dozens and dozens of clinical research projects that go through there on a yearly basis. And it's very simple and easy to add a quick breath analysis to each one of those. So you could imagine the potential uh, in terms of the large data set and the amount of data you could generate by having a breath profile on every one of those individuals, uh, not to mention the research momentum we have. Now, beyond that, the potential for collaboration with the breath is, is really outstanding. So uh, breath samples don't just have to be measured on site. You can collect this in certain sampling bags, and you can ship that from a distant location down to us at Pennington. Uh, and naturally, this all has a strong potential for commercialization when it comes to uh, personalized medicine and nutrition. I mean, I think everyone has seen how popular in the health and wellness world uh, lots of data on yourself is. Uh, could you imagine blowing into a device and getting personalized information about your internal metabolism. Um, so just as a summary, I mean, the, the breath really does represent this new tissue that is unexplored in terms of relationships with health, health of disease. Um, we've got publications momentum in the area and just uh, a, a really high potential for benefits for collaborating with us. So I thank you all for your time. Um, I am a millennial, so I don't carry physical business cards, but I have a <laughs> QR code of my my information right there. So uh, with that, I just want to thank all our collaborators and, and sponsors to the state, and I welcome any of your questions. Hi. So you've probably heard about a consumer product called Lumen. How is it different, or is it similar or the same, or how Lumen is different than what you're pitching here? I would say what uh, we have is um, a, an intense focus on scientific integrity and a precision of information that you can't get elsewhere. So uh, I guess it depends what you're trying to get out of those devices, but I think there's a difference between um, having information and having information that is uh, directly relevant to your actual internal biology rather than maybe a surrogate. Do you believe that there are consistently unique markers in each individual's breath so that you could identify them uh, just like a fingerprint, actually? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I would compare this somewhat to the data we have on the microbiome, right, where there's a lot of variability between person to person. Uh, and I think there's a lot of information that you can gain out of that. But certainly there's a lot of variability and noise to sift through. And I think we're on the really um, early uh, part of understanding what we can learn about that information. And is it individualized? Can we group people? Um, I, I think that's where the research has to go. But it, it's, a, I think, a, a, an area that needs a lot more research. And for one more question. Uh, is this device portable? Can we take it to uh, 
different places to test on patients? Sure, so the breath collection is portable in terms of those individual bags. To measure a thousand molecules at once, uh, that is currently not portable. That is a, an on-site uh, mass spectrometer. Yeah, do, do you see this more effective as a cute one snapshot in time, or do you see it as taking breath continually throughout the day, throughout the weeks to see a pattern? Uh, from my perspective, I think the best benefit is going, going to be over time because of the large uh, variability person to person. So I think when you start having a measure at one point and you take the same person over time or with interventions, then you can start to look at changes. And that may offer more information as opposed to just taking different groups in a cross section. Uh, but with, you know, a thousand some odd molecules, I think there's a lot of potential for either of those approaches.